<laughs> well, aloha, everyone. And thank you, Celeste. I'm so happy to be here. And yes, it is early. It's 8 a.m. my time. So my fiance got the kids off to school so that I could be here with you. And I'm happy to get started. So the topic for today is um, basically, I just wanted to do a Q&A because I can talk about, I can talk until the cows come home about sleep. Sleep is absolutely my passion. I love everything about it. And what I find is oftentimes most helpful is actually just to answer questions. So I don't know, how many people do we have on today? Is, it, is there a good number or are there just a, a few people who can make it? No, there's actually a good number. It's been up and down through the whole thing. And then of course, you know, the recording after the fact to get so yes. much more attention as well, because our YouTube channel gets, uh, gets a lot of hits as well. So hopefully we can kind of cover everything. If it's okay, I'll start in on my questions and you can kind of build from there. Or yeah, you... I was, so I was going to give a few sleep facts. Just Absolutely. To kind of Let's do that. Websites. And then if anybody, while we're talking or after Celeste, uh, you ask your questions, if anybody else has questions who's on, you can just pop them in the chat and we'll, we'll get them answered. Awesome. So um, when you see me looking off to the side, it's because I have another screen. So that's what's going on. Um, so I'm just going to run through these because I think they're all so fascinating. So one in four married couples sleep in separate beds. That means that only, you know, we have this big mystique about if you love someone, you have to sleep in the same bed as them. And uh, unfortunately, that doesn't always work out. So <clears throat> that's something that I really like to educate people about is the fact that you can absolutely have a wonderfully loving relationship with someone and choose to sleep in separate beds. And humans spend one third of their lives sleeping. So that's a huge chunk of time. And so it's really important to have good quality of sleep and also to make sure that your bedroom environment is one that is healthy for you and conducive to both quality and quantity of sleep. And sleep deprivation will kill you more quickly than food deprivation. So uh, this is just a cool little fact. Um, they used to do the Guinness Book of World Records for the person who can sleep the uh, go without sleep the longest, but that's the one out of all these daring things that they do for the Guinness Book of World Records, that's the one that they took out and they don't let people do anymore because they uh, basically discovered that it was something that was more dangerous than all these other daring feats to have someone um, try to go without sleep for an extended period of time. And the average person can sleep, uh, can survive two weeks without water, but only 10 days without sleep. And humans are the only mammals that uh, with that sleep that will willingly delay it, which I think is so important because we have a um, an epidemic of sleep deprivation on the planet right now, and that is due to a lot of different factors. But we're the only we're we're supposed to be the most intelligent species, and yet we're the only species who will stay up and watch TikTok or, you know, do all the things that we do and not prioritize our sleep. So I find that really fascinating as well. And um, I could go on and on, but let's, we can come back to the facts if we want to, but that's just a little bit to get, to get us started. And Celeste, if you have some questions, I'd love to hear them. Awesome. Absolutely. So we've already had one in the chat. I'll just start with that one first. Is a nap helpful or hurtful for a good night's sleep? I see you, Lee. So I love this question. It's a great question. And the answer, and you'll, you'll hear that a lot of my answers are, it depends. And in this instance, a nap can be really, really wonderful. It depends on the length of time that you do it and the time of day. So there's something called sleep pressure, which builds as we, the, the longer we stay awake. So there's two different things that control sleep. One is our circadian rhythm which is uh, basically impacted by many different things, but primarily by the cycles of light and dark in nature. And so the exposure to light is really, really an important factor in our ability to sleep well. But the other thing is sleep pressure. And as I just said, that is something that occurs based on a chemical called adenosine. And when you uh, go without sleep, it builds in the body and then it makes us more sleepy. So if you take a nap, 
and you take it too late in the day, too close to when you're supposed to be going to sleep, then you won't have the sleep pressure that will allow you to feel drowsy. So it's really independent for the person. And some people are, you know, I talk to people frequently about sleep and some people will say, I cannot nap. It's, you know, it makes me feel worse. And some people say, I absolutely need a nap in the afternoon. What I will say is that we have a natural um, time where our cortisol levels drop in the day. And that's been traditionally known as siesta time in, in cultures uh, like in Europe. And, um, and so if you can time your nap with that siesta time, which is usually around 2 p.m. in the afternoon, then that's a really great time because the body naturally wants to rest during that time. And even if you don't nap or don't want to nap, if you can honor your body, so, you know, we're here for the Holistic Lifestyle Expo and part of having holistic sleep is really honoring those cycles um, and the, the cycles that occur on a daily basis in your body. And one of them is that you have this natural dip of energy in the afternoon. And in our modern culture, because we have so many demands on us, uh, most people will power through it by eating a piece of chocolate or having another cup of coffee. And that really isn't good for the long term in terms of the health of your nervous system, because your body is actually trying to take a rest during that time period in the early afternoon in the day. And so even if you don't nap, if you can just take a rest, even if it's just 10 minutes, you know, shutting your eyes, breathing something, if you're at work, you know, getting, getting a small break, it would be so good for your nervous system and it'll actually help you sleep better. And what I've noticed is that it seems like what happens during that time is that I call it um, like brain defragging. So when I take a rest during that time, what I notice is that all of the, um, all of the stuff that I've experienced in the morning, the emotional stuff, the learning that I've done, it just has a chance to kind of simmer down so that my brain and my nervous system doesn't get overwhelmed. And then I'm more capable and more available and more present for what, what is going to happen in the later part of my day. So it actually, just that short little break will give me more space to be um, more functional in, in the later part of the day in the evening. So I hope that answers your question, Lee. If you have a follow-up question, please feel free to ask it. And it says, uh, there's another question. I think this is also from Lee. Working the graveyard, <laughs> good, thank you, Lee. Um, working the graveyard shift changes sleep habits. Can that be harmful long-term or does your body get used to it? This is another great question. Um, I've actually interviewed a, um, a woman, she's uh, called the Night Shift uh, Biohacker, I think she has an Instagram account, and she chooses to work uh, the night shift consistently, and she's a, she's a nurse. And so she does all these different things in order to try to biohack her health and optimize her health, and she's doing a really good job. However, most people don't take that much care and attention to working the graveyard shift and they have associated working um, nights to uh, being a, a carcinogen. It's that detrimental to your health. So I know that there's people that need to work the graveyard shift. I know that we need workers to do that. Um, I would say that if you have any health issues, if you're working the graveyard shift and you have any health issues at all, then I would really look into a job change first and foremost, because it is, and this is a hard truth. And I hate to say it because I know people have to do it. And, and I know people need to make a living, but it is really, really detrimental to your health. And it's something that is likely to diminish your longevity. Given that someone does need to work the graveyard shift, there's things that you can do that can help you. One of them, um, like I discussed earlier, is being able to, as much as possible, control the, the cycles of light and dark. So most people that are working a great graveyard shift are exposed to really, really bright um, fluorescent light at in the middle of the night, which is when we should be in complete darkness. 
And it really messes up our circadian rhythm and messes up so many different functions in the body. So one thing that you can do if the environment, if the workplace that you're in will allow it is to use um, a lens technology that will regulate the light that's coming into your eyes because we primarily receive um, light through our eyes, although we also have photoreceptors on our skin as well. So wearing a long shirt that covers your skin so that you're not absorbing that, um, that light, the light into your skin, wearing a hat if you need to, and then wearing a lens technology can really help with that. Also eating, um, modulating the times of the day that you're eating and not eating. So a lot of shift workers will have like a stash of candy in their, in their drawer to just kind of make it through the night. And that's really not helpful. So there's specific ways that you can hack your nutrition and hack the timing of when you eat in order to better mimic what would be going on if you were sleeping. Another thing um, that is really important is to make sure that when you do get off of your shift, you stay up long enough just to get that first morning light of, of sunlight exposure. And then a lot of um, shift workers who are who are conscious of this and doing the best that they can will use things like um, infrared light in order to get more of the light frequencies that they're missing during the day. So those are just some of the things that you can do um, in order to, to um, sleep better. And then obviously when you're sleeping during the day, when you're catching up on that sleep, making, making sure that you are sleeping in a completely dark room, making sure that your home as much as possible has that um, dark light and that you're not then exposing yourself to more of that blue light. And I do want to say something about this because it's um, a common misnomer. We've heard about blue blocking glasses and the idea that blue light is bad for us. And the truth is that um, we, so the sun has a whole bunch of different spectrums of light and we need all of them. The problem is that because of uh, the fact that we are on digital devices all the time and because of the type of light that comes out of uh, fluorescent light bulbs, which are the ones that we use most frequently because they're also the most um, economical, those have a really uh, unnatural high amount of the blue spectrum of light. And so the amount of light that we would naturally get from the sun, from sunlight, is much more um, balanced. However, the uh, light that we get from screens and the light that we get from light bulbs is imbalanced and is much higher in the uh, blue uh, spectrum. So there's a few companies who have done a really, really good job of making sure that the lenses that they create balance the light, but they don't completely block the blue light because you don't want that. You just want it to naturally mimic the sunlight as much as possible. And so um, just making sure that when you're at home, after you get off of your shift, and um, you're trying to wind down that you uh, manipulate your environment to have basically the same kind of light that you ha would have in the evening or in the early morning, which would be more in the red and the orange frequencies of um, the light spectrum and not that blue light because the blue light basically tells our bodies that it's, um, that it's high noon. So when we're on our screens, when you're working that night shift, you're getting mixed signals that's telling your body it's high noon all throughout the night. And then the body doesn't know what to do and it doesn't know when to digest food and, and when, to, um, when to regulate the immune system and do all the things that it needs to do to take care of yourself. That's so interesting. And it, it did also answer another question we had that the question had been, is the TV, computer, et cetera, really bad when you know, as you're going to sleep. So you answered that one as well. That was great. We have one here on the Q and a right now. So um, can I expand on that for just yeah, one second? Absolutely. I was specifically talking about uh, night shift workers, but it's really important for everyone yeah. in term, especially if you're having issues with insomnia. So when we, when we evolved over the course of a really, really long time, the only light exposure that we had was the light from the moon, maybe a campfire and then, and then sunlight. And people lived outside. They lived in you know, caves or huts or something like that. And they woke up when the sun rose and then they were outside in the natural sunlight all day long. 
And then as the sun would set, they would start to wind down. They might sit around the campfire for a little while and they would get sleepy and they would go to bed. And so now we have all of these weird spectrums of light and their, and the exposure to that at all different times of day. So even for someone who's not working uh, a graveyard shift, if you're on your computer all day or you're in, a, in an indoor environment all day, that can really disrupt your circadian rhythm. And so what can you do about it? You can do the same thing. You can wear a lens technology, which I don't know where mine are, but if I wasn't doing a presentation, I would be wearing a lens technology that balances that light spectrum while I'm on my computer. And um, the other thing that you can do is be mindful of the light exposure that you have at night and mimic what's going on in the external environment, out, outdoors and nature, in your home environment. So, so many people aren't aware of this and they'll just leave bright lights on or as they're getting ready for bed in their bathroom, they'll have these bright lights on. Or if they're waking up in the night, they'll flip on the light when they go to the bathroom and then have this bright light. And all of those things are really confusing to the body and disrupt your circadian rhythm. So if you can get amber colored bulbs or red um, bulbs, it's kind of funny because it makes your house look a little bit weird. But in my house, after, after dark, we don't use any bright lights. We have red lights all over the house and it's, it's kind of like really nice mood lighting, but it also really helps with sleep. So it's important for, for everyone, especially in the digital age that we're in, not just graveyard shift workers. That's awesome. My house is going to look like a, like a club at night now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So another question on Q and a, what is your opinion on having pets in bed? Great question. My answer is it depends, right? For some people, it's very comforting. It's wonderful. It doesn't bother them. For some people, it um, can affect them because they have allergies or because the pet is moving. And I will say this, if you're not sleeping well, or if you're waking up in the night and you sleep with your pet, try to not sleep with that pet and see what changes. Some people, I am one of them. I actually just found this out recently because I did a um, functional genetic test with a company called the DNA company. They're, they're pretty new, but they have a fantastic test. And what I learned from them is that they're, they, they tested actually about 4,000 people um, specifically looking at their sleep and their sleep patterns. And what they discovered is that over 3,000 out of the 4,000 people that they tested have this issue where they have a gene that causes them to have this is kind of technical, but it causes them to have um, disrupted serotonin production throughout the night, which makes them much more um, sensitive to any sound or any disturbance in their environment. And so for those people, which is actually the majority of people, um, you need to be very careful of your sleep environment in terms of temperature disruption, noise disruption, movement because all of those things will unfortunately impact your sleep. And so if there's a, a cat or a dog that, you know, is just shifting in bed or even a partner for that, for the, for that um, matter, all of these things can, can disrupt sleep. So it's something to experiment with and to figure out whether, you know, it's, it's an issue for you. Got it. Okay. So this one came through on our Instagram post. Um, there are a lot of sleep apps and different devices. Now are things like the aura ring good to use, or is it just a play basically is what they're asking, I guess. Yeah. So again, <laughs> I again, record, but it, it depends. depends. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I don't in general, like to wearable trackers. And the reason for that is because for several reasons, first of all, some people are really sensitive. And I know that the aura ring says there's no emissions that are coming off of it, no electromagnetic frequency emissions, but still some people are just sensitive to those kinds of things. Another thing is that it can work backwards. It can be kind of like reverse psychology where 
all of a sudden now you're worrying about your sleep more and you're, you know, oh, I didn't get a good sleep score last night. And oh, I did it. So it depends on the kind of person you are. It depends on the reason that you're using something like that. I think that getting a baseline, it can be a good thing. But here's the thing. You don't need a sleep tracker to know whether you got a good night's sleep. You will either wake up and you will be bright and refreshed and you'll have sustained uh, natural energy where you don't have to be caffeinating um, to get through your day, or you're going to feel crappy and you're not going to be able to have memory recall and you're going to drag throughout the day and get sleepy. And, and then you'll know the, the caveat to this is for people who are wondering if they might have obstructive sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea is something that you really, really need to have addressed medically because it is another one of those things that like graveyard shift working is a carcinogen. And there's a difference between snoring and having obstructive sleep apnea. And some people who have obstructive sleep apnea don't really snore. So you can't use that as a litmus, but what you can use as a litmus is um, there's actually a, a, a test that you can take and see how you score on it. But am I waking up sleepy? Am I feeling drowsy? If I sit in a chair for um, 10 minutes, would I be likely to drift off to sleep? Do I ever feel like when I'm driving that I'm nodding off? Things like that um, will indicate, am I overweight? Um, do I have other health issues? Things like this will let you know that obstructive sleep apnea could be something that's going on with you. And then a, uh, a tracker or better off, they now have home um, polysomnogram tests that you can take. And this can help you determine whether you have um, OSA. And again, the sleep trackers, they're fun. You know, it's, 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 I think we just have to be mindful of why we're using it. And the impact that it's having on us and whether it's actually helping us or just making us more anxious or giving us more mind chatter, you know, that's, right. that's preventing us from sleeping well. Absolutely. Okay. What are your thoughts on sleep supplements such as melatonin? Yes. So melatonin is, you know, like the, the rock star, the supermodel of sleep. And it's really interesting because Melatonin only works if you are having difficulty uh, falling asleep because you have a disrupted circadian rhythm cycle. So we need melatonin. Melatonin is the um, hormone that tells our bodies that it's time to fall asleep. So melatonin is really good if you have a, um, if you're working the graveyard shift or if you are traveling between time zones and your body is confused about what time it is. Or for some people, um, as they age, they don't produce as much melatonin, so they might need to supplement with melatonin. And it's interesting too, because melatonin has been shown to be um, uh, effective uh, ag against cancer. So it has its benefits, but for people who have chronic severe insomnia and they're waking up in the middle of the night, it's unlikely that it's going to be melatonin that's going to solve that because it's unlikely that it's a mel melatonin deficiency that is, that is causing that in the first place. So I would say um, there's, there's many different supplements to take. Some of them are really effective for sleep and some of them are not. And it really depends on what's going on with the individual. And I have also a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, not, not commonly ag agreed upon opinion also about uh, sleep medications. So there's this opinion that sleep meds are bad and that they should never be used. And, it, and I work holistically with people. And so for me, I know that there's this very narrow definition of what it means to be holistic and holistic is basically equated with completely natural, you know, not using anything with chemicals or that kind of a thing. And for me, the definition of holistic is actually slightly different, which means you look at the individual and what the individual needs and how that individual body functions and 
and how best for that individual to get from point A to point B. And so for some people, for uh, because chronic insomnia can be so, um, so anxiety creating for, for some people, using a sleep medication for a short period of time just to get them over that hump of, oh my gosh, I can't fall asleep no matter what. I'm never going to be able to fall asleep. It's never going to happen for me can be a really effective tool. There's other things like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which are also very effective for some people. But I just, I, I get frustrated when people just automatically assume that using a sleep med is never okay. And they kind of um, make people feel ashamed for even suggesting that that might be something that they want to try. Interesting. Very true. Okay. This next question is very, it's very simple and to the point, but I think it's probably if you would ask a lot of the people out there, you know, give me a, something you want to know about sleep, this would be it. And this, it's funny because I really do think that the answer to this one is it depends, <laughs> but the question is, is how much sleep do you need? Yeah, actually this is kind of a not, and it depends. I, I, <laughs> awesome. <yeah>. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, I'm sure you know someone who says, or there are a lot of people in the media, famous people in the media who will say, I do great on six hours of sleep, or, you know, I only take micro naps throughout the day and I'm rocking it. And the reality is that the vast majority of people need between seven and a half and nine hours of sleep per night. And the people who need less than that, or the people, we'll just go with less, the people who need less than that is like 0.0001% of the population. And it's because they have a genetic anomaly. So if you're, and, and you can test for that, you can actually test to see if you have that gene. But most people know, oh yeah, if I get less than, you know, seven hours of sleep, I'm a wreck. Or, you know, I need, I need at least eight hours of sleep. And here's why there's the um, discrepancy between the 7.5 and the nine hours of sleep. You have to understand how a normal sleep cycle works in order to understand what that's about. So we sleep for approximately 90 minutes per night, but for some people that sleep cycle, and then we go through that same uh, approximate 90 minute cycle several times in the night. However, for some people, it might be 78 minutes. And for some people, it might be 95 minutes. And when you multiply that by the number of sleep cycles that we have in a night, and you get that total number, that's how some people only need the seven and a half and some people need the need the nine. Um, but yeah, if you're, uh, if you're like the vast, vast majority of people, you really do need um, approximately eight hours of sleep per night. Awesome. Okay. Got it. And next question, I'm going to try to get through these so we can get through them all. We've got three more. Um, let's see here. This one was just from social. Okay. Um, my boyfriend has full body twitches, almost like his whole body tenses, then releases. It's very rhythmic. Like every 10 seconds seems to happen when he's trying to fall asleep. What is this? Yeah, so those are um, very, very common for, for everyone. And we all have them to a degree. Babies have them too. And um, it's, it's as we're dropping into the deeper stages of sleep, it's completely normal. Um, if it happens all throughout the night, then that's something that you might want to have looked into because he could have a, um, an issue with his sleep that is more than just the normal thing. But if he's sleeping um, well, then, then it's fine. Here's where that question comes into play is, does this person who is sleeping in the same bed as him have issues because he's keeping her awake? Because if it's happening just when they're both falling asleep, that could be fine. Um, or it could be something that's actually really disrupting her because he's twitching and she's simultaneously trying to fall asleep at the same time. And because she's one of those people who's genetically sensitive to movement, it's actually causing her to, um, to have difficulty falling asleep. And for some people, if they get 
uh, woken up while they're falling asleep, then they, they let go of that sleep pressure, but it also kind of creates a fight or flight response in their body. And then they can't fall back asleep for a while. So I would say for you, it could be completely normal or it's possible that it's, um, that you actually have an issue with your sleep that you need to get, or he has an issue with his sleep that he needs to get looked at. And there might need to be some navigating in terms of how you guys, uh, sleep together because you might need to, you know, crawl into bed 20 minutes later than him, just so that as he's falling in and as he's twitching, it doesn't disrupt your ability to fall asleep. Great. Okay. Next question. Is CBD good to take to help fall asleep? Yeah. Again, this is, this is an, it depends question. So CBD is amazing for so many different things for anyone who doesn't know very much about it. They recently discovered that we have an entire system in our body that's similar, you know, not similar to, but just like the lymphatic system and the circulatory system, we have the endocannabinoid system, which is specifically um, utilizes uh, CBD. And we have all these receptors in our body that does so many different things. So for, let me back up a little bit. Uh, Centuries ago, before we had this prohibition on hemp and on marijuana, uh, there was a lot of um, hemp and marijuana growing just naturally everywhere because it grows like a weed. That's part of the reason that the word weed is associated with this plant. And so we all humans um, would naturally have more of this just in our system because we would get it from the pollen in the air. We would get it from the animals that we would eat because the animals would graze on it. So in, in comparison to our bodies uh, several hundred years ago, we have somewhat of a deficiency in these, um, in these CBD chemicals in our body. And so a lot of people find that supplementing with CBD is very helpful to them. Um, for sleep specifically, some people will try it and they'll say, oh my gosh, it was amazing. I couldn't sleep. I took it. Now I can sleep great. So what I hear more frequently is I took it, it worked for a while, but now it's not working anymore. Why? And um, there's a company that I have interviewed the founder of and um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful interview and he's uh, very well versed. That could be because you're not taking the proper dose um, and your body has gotten kind of used to that dose. It could also be because you have a different underlying um, sleep issue and the CBD was kind of like a band-aid, but it didn't really address the underlying root cause of what's going on with you. So I don't think that there's any harm for anyone in trying CBD. And when you try, you definitely wanna start with a very low and slow dose and titrate up from there. There's an organization called Realm of Caring and you can check them out. It's I think just realmofcaring.org and they actually offer free consultations to anyone. So if, especially if you have any health issues um, that you are, that, you know, that you're predisposed to, I recommend that you contact Realm of Caring, get a consultation with them, tell them specifically what's going on with your, with your health. And then they will advise you about the best way to supplement with CBD and see if it's effective for you. One other thing that I will say about CBD is that there's lots of different types of CBD out there and you can get it from all over the place. And CBD is a plant that um, actually helps to kind of leach the chemicals out of the soil. And so you want to make sure that you're getting a completely organic CBD because you don't want to get something that has um, funky chemicals in it and ingest those when you're trying to do something to improve your health. The other thing that I will say is that there are um, lots of different CBD isolates and those are very much more chemically um, oriented. Like if you see them, they actually look like a little white powder instead of, you know, the green plant that it, that it is. And so you really want to get a CBD that is full spectrum. 
um, because there is something called the entourage effect, which is basically the idea that all the different constituents and polyphenols and the different parts of the plant work in harmony and in synergy together to, uh, to do the magical, wonderful things that it does in the body. And um, when you take an isolate, it doesn't have that broad spectrum effect. So definitely look for something that is full spectrum as well. Great. Okay. Last question. Pillows or no pillows? Yay. <laughs> Very personal, uh, personal uh, choice here. Um, I worked with a physical therapist here on uh, my little island and he has goodness. I think he has eight children and he would tell me, cause I have a whiplash injury. So I was seeing him to get help for my cervical spine. And he told me a story about how all of his children, after they would go to bed at, and they're all grown now, but when they were little, he would take their pillows and after they fall, they fell asleep, he would yank them all out so that they weren't sleeping with a pillow. So there's different reasons that you want to use a pillow and there's different um, things to be aware of. For someone who's dealing with obstructive sleep apnea, it may be absolutely necessary that they keep their head elevated and sleep at an incline because one of the things that causes obstructive sleep apnea is that your uh, a person's jaw can actually kind of slide back in their throat and then obstruct their, their airway. So people that have this going on find that when they sleep elevated, it, their jaw slides back less and then they have, um, they can, they can breathe better. Uh, so that's important for anyone with OSA. For other people, um, if, if you can sleep, if you, so it, it's sleeping position too. So this is kind of um, just an aside, but they've, there have been studies that have been done that show that if you sleep on your side, your glymphatic system, which is the system in your brain that, that detoxifies your brain at night while you sleep can work more effectively. So for most people sleeping on your side is likely to be the healthiest way to sleep. That said, whatever position you sleep in that you sleep well in, do that. So if you're gonna sleep on your side, getting one of those pillows that has the curve in it that supports your, um, your neck so that your cervical spine so that you aren't you know, crunching your neck is really important. Um, and if you're a back sleeper, then obviously sleeping without a pillow is probably best because your spine will lay flat and it will be more healthy. Um, so, it kind of depends. And, and I would say, and this is true for mattresses and pillows. I mentioned earlier, we spend a third of our lives in bed. So you really want to make sure that your mattress and your pillow are non-toxic because most of the mattresses and most of the pillows are treated, especially in the United States with a whole ton of chemicals and flame retardants. And that's when we sleep, uh, our bodies actually go into a parasympathetic nervous system state. And that means that our immune system guard is down during that time while we sleep. So we're very, very vulnerable. Our immune system, our body is very vulnerable when we're in a, um, a sleep state. And so that's the worst time of day to be exposed to chemicals. So really looking at your bedroom environment and getting as many toxins especially out of the mattress and out of the pillow that you can um, will be, you know, is, is the best thing that you can do for your health. Awesome. Okay. Susie, tell us where we can find you. So I have a website. It's just my name. So it's Susie, S-U-Z-I-E, S-E-N-K.com. And uh, you can go there and you can sign up for my mailing list and you can get free gifts. And that's the best way to stay in touch with me and find out what's going on. Um, I regularly do events and, um, and have wonderful fun stuff. And like I said, I'm a, uh, I, can, I can talk forever about sleep. So I, um, I oftentimes will share different information through that newsletter. And um, 
my practice is not just sleep, it's holistic wellness as well. And I um, work through a functional medicine perspective. So I don't just cover sleep, I cover everything related to sleep because truly there is nothing related to health that's not related to sleep because sleep is the foundation of health. So you can find out more by going to my website.